Welcome to Om Times TV, a division of Om Times Media and Broadcasting. Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series, where leading new thought teachers, speakers, and authors share the intimate stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired them the most on their spiritual journey. From well-known classics to hidden gems you might never have heard of, the No BS Spiritual Book Club saves you time and money by sharing reliable recommendations from those who've walked the path before you. The No BS Spiritual Book Club, the only No BS guide to the best spiritual books to inspire your own journey of self-discovery. Here's your host, founder of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, Sandy Sedgebeer. Hello and welcome. Joining me today to share the 10 best spiritual books that inspired her the most on her life journey is cosmologist, planetary healer, futurist, best-selling author, co-founder of Whole World View, and dedicated ABBA fan, Jude Carriban, <laughs> PhD. <laughs> Jude Carriban has traveled the world for over two decades in service to planetary healing, raising awareness and empowering fundamental change and sustainable solutions to global problems. She's the author of seven non-fiction books available in 16 languages and 26 countries, including Cosmos, a co-creator's guide to the whole world, co-authored with Dr. Irvin Laszlo, the cosmic hologram in formation at the center of creation, and her latest book, The Story of Gaia, The Big Breath and the Evolutionary Journey of Our Conscious Planet, which really is a must read for anyone wanting to see the big picture of how humanity arrived at where we are today and our co-creative potential for conscious evolution. Jude Carriven, welcome. Thank you, Sandy. I love the bit that you started with, dedicated <laughs> Abba fan. Quite right, too. <laughs> Quite right. I totally agree with that one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you grew up in the north of England. Your father was a coal miner. Tell me a little bit about your childhood and your relationship with books. My mum taught me to read when I was three years old, which is very early. And mm. she left school at 14. She was the youngest of, I think, seven children. Didn't have any opportunity to be educated beyond that age. Um, left school and started work then. But for me, she wanted an education. And so she, she was the one who inspired me with a love of books. She would read to me, read to me, read to me, taught me all my letters uh, so that I could write before I even got to the school. So I was a voracious reader by the time I got to the school gates. And um, that was very unusual in, in my community because it was a mining community. Um, you know, I was uh, eventually I was the first member of my family to go to university and I went to Oxford mm -hmm. University. So and it was my mum, you know, without her, I don't know where I would be, but I love her so much. She was such an inspiration. And the greatest thing she gave me was love. Yeah. The greatest what thing sort she of gave books me did you were you did you love to read as a kid? Fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> I, much. <laughs> <laughs> I loved I loved I can remember one which was set in a forest and there was a wizard and there was a, a, a sort of a young child but the young child was incredibly curious and I really I really associated myself with that child because as my mum would say my my main word when I was young was why why why, why? yeah why? <laughs> you're not a Gemini are you no, I'm married to a Gemini moon, um, but I, <laughs> I am a Sagittarius. So oh, my curiosity okay. has always been that sort of deeper level of understanding and yeah. the nature of reality rather than, you know, a, a Gemini type, oh, I'll have that and I'll have that and I'll have that, although I'm, I can do that too. Yeah, yeah. So you you um, experienced multidimensional realities in childhood. I mean, all your life, haven't you? Yeah, well, certainly since I was about four years old. That's the first time I remember. And I do remember because, you know, I've told this story quite often. A discarnate light came into my room and started having a conversation with me. And, of course, it was an inner conversation. 
but I heard it very clearly and it was so inviting. It was so welcoming. And I almost felt that I was being taken by the hand and welcomed into this, what has become, you know, a lifelong journey of, of, of ongoing discovery and certainly multidimensional realms. And along the way, my mum used to say I talk with anybody, but she never knew quite who I was talking with. Did you tell her about these experiences? I didn't. And I've often wondered why not, because she would not have discounted them. She would not have sort of said, oh, that's nonsense, mm -hmm. imagination. She would have been very open, very loving, very welcoming, as long as she felt that they were benevolent. But, you yeah. know, I think I was just having too much of a good time. And I know that I could have told mum, but I suspect, although it never occurred to me, that I would have been poo-pooed by other friends and my schoolmates, teachers possibly, mm. you know, others in my community. So it never occurred to me. And yet I know that mum would have been accepting of that. So it's no surprise then that, you know, you read books about wizards and things. You were interested <laughs> in fantasy. Which I, isn't it, fantasy at all. It's not fantasy at all. And, I, and the books I also loved were about nature spirits. Yeah. as well, yeah. elemental beings and nature spirits, because these are the folks that I, I was meeting. You know, these are the yeah. folks I was having conversations with and adventures with. So it was, it was actually quite challenging sometimes to differentiate, you know, between those worlds. And, yeah. you know, and, 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 but I learned to. And I, but I valued what I was reading and I hugely valued what I was experiencing. So was that the genesis of your interest in cosmology? Yeah, because I didn't even know the word at that age. Yeah. Um, and, and cosmology is actually quite a relatively new word in scientific circles, because when I was growing up, we didn't have the Hubble telescope or the James Webb. So, you know, when I was growing up, other galaxies beyond our Milky Way galaxy were often called island universes. They weren't really understood. Um, when I was growing up, you know, the Big Bang Theory came along when I was, you know, in my teens, early 20s. So it was, and then it, it was still a, a sort of, you know, you saw as far as our galaxy a bit beyond. But cosmology is the study of the, not just the entire universe, but I would describe it as the understanding of the nature of reality itself, because it's not just the appearance of our physical universe. As a cosmologist, I'm curious about the, the, the ultimate nature of reality itself. Mm, yeah. Now, you hold a PhD in cosmology from the University of Reading. You've researched ancient cosmologies. You've got a master's degree in physics from Oxford, specialising in cosmology and quantum physics. I find it interesting that your father spent a good part of his life working underground in the dark belly of Gaia. Mm -hmm. And know. you've spent a good part of yours looking up at the heavens, studying the cosmos. Is there some kind of connection there? Oh, I'm sure there is. And, and it's only fairly later in my life that I really, really, really entered into a profound and very loving relationship with Gaia. You know, when I was young, I was out there. I was, you know, journeying amongst the stars out in the wherever and a multidimensional. I was not grounded. And I think having dad and mum, they were the sort of the ones holding me, grounding yeah. me, you know, so because great. otherwise I'd have been off wherever. And, you know, the thing with my dad, he was a wonderful man. He was a gentle giant. My mum was my size, five foot three. He was six foot four. Um, he was a gentle giant of a man. But, you know, the coal mining um, was such an awful, you know, it was a great community because everybody pulled together. But as, as work, it was horrendous. And he died when he was in his early 30s. Wow. Um, so my mum was widowed uh, when she was 40. He was younger than she was. And she had us as kids, my brother and myself, to bring up on her own. Mm. You know, without him and she loved him all the rest of her life she never took a wedding ring off it was a lifelong love and even though you know he'd passed on he was with her every day mm. so let's talk about your books how did you whittle you know I'm <laughs> sure you've been an avid reader how did you whittle your list down to just 10 what criteria did you use 
A good question, given the background to, to, to my Zoom and around the room, by the way, and beyond. Um, they were the books that really touched me deeply, not just intellectually, but deeply in my heart and soul and body. And in all cases, they came to me. We were talking just before we came on about, you know, when the time's right, you know, often mm. a book will fall, you know, fall off the shelf. All of these books came to me at a moment in my life where I was really open and, and needed the, the message and the wisdom and the insights that they offer. I've listed your books in the order that you sent them to me. Is that a chronological order? Is this the order in which you came across them? Or no, is that more it's random? not actually. No, it was, it, I, 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 you know me, I don't use the word random. <laughs> <laughs> there was a reason, but for the life of me, I can't see what it was. But um, it wasn't chronological. I think the first book of the 10 uh, was actually the next to the last in the list. Okay. Um, and that's the quadrivium. Do you want to do it in that order then? Because I've be got it in the order that you actually gave me, but it's up to you. I think I'd like to do it chronologically because then we can sort of go yeah. through perhaps the okay. journey, if that, if that makes sense. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Okay. so let's talk about quadrivium then. Well, the quadrivium is a book which is edited by John Martineau. It's a very beautiful book, actually. Um, I will dig it out for us in a minute it's a very beautiful book um but it's actually what it is it's a it's a summary of a four level educational system and this was an educational system that's based on ancient wisdom and it's based on a cosmology of wholeness and harmony and consciousness and within that the other three aspects of it are geometry which is number, it's all based on number, basically. So number, but number in space as geometry and number in time as music and then number of itself in terms of archetypes and then all of it wrapped in a sort of unity, unity-based framework of a unified cosmology. And that four basis, that fourfold education was an education given in mystery schools, in medieval academies, across and across many traditions. And of course, now at the leading edge of science, we're also realizing that number, geometry, music, okay. wholeness mm. are all fundamental. Yeah. Yeah. So when did that book come into your life and how did it come into your life? It came into my life actually a long time after. I was very aware and studying these these the, the quadrivium per se. The book itself is relatively recent. It's one of a, a, a series um, of old, of wooden books, which are wonderful books. But it's the largest one that I'm aware of. All the others are, are tiny little books, but they're about you know they're about um, crop circles, they're about mm. stone circles, they're about so many different aspects of insights and wisdom teachings but this is quite a chunky book and it's one to delve into so only probably I don't know a few years ago but it was so lovely to find it so lovely to realize that somebody had taken the care yeah. to bring all this together in a beautiful book that's accessible for anyone who's interested in these subjects. So how did it impact you? It was just that sense of joy that, you know, all I'd been researching, studying in many different ways for so long, you know, decades on decades on decades on decades, finally had been brought together. So the subtitle is The Four Classical Liberal Arts of Number, Geometry, Music and Cosmology. So it offers what it says on the tin, you know, <laughs> if you delve into it, that's what you get. So it's how to make a perfect universe, basically. Is it hard read? No, I don't think it is. And it's very deliberate. I mean, this is the joy about wooden books as a series. They bring their subjects into very, uh, you know, great accessibility. And it's mm. a book, you know, you might want to delve into, not read all the way through, but delve yeah. into and come back to. Mm. Yeah, I've heard about these wooden books. They're supposed to be rather beautiful. And that's the other thing. They are very beautiful. Yeah. They're very beautiful. You know, there's a lot of care taken in them. They've got some beautiful, I mean, the graphics are beautiful. It's not just text. 
it's got some beautiful graphics that really bring the subjects alive. Um, I love them. I think we've got, I think everyone that's ever been published. <laughs> well, I would think that it's quite an honour for a book to be chosen to be produced in wood. So it, that already raises the bar, doesn't it? It does. And some of the original ones were, I mean, this is sort of a hard back. So the, the name wooden books doesn't necessarily mean that they're now made of wood. But, but there were some, yeah. But yeah, and that's that sense of them being grounded. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, that wood is a sense of a living, a living yeah. book. So on all levels, there's a, a beautiful amount of care and expertise and joy that I think goes into each of them. And certainly as a reader, I so appreciate yeah. that. Mm. So what is the second book on your list? The second book in, in chronological terms is The Lord of the Rings. Ah. Ah. Yeah. ah. Yes, it, comes, <laughs> it actually does come up quite a lot. Um, sure. and, and so it should. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, there is no competition. I, uh, no, there isn't. <laughs> there so when isn't. did you read it? Well, this copy, if you can see it, it's a very beautiful copy. And mm. see how thin it is. Mm. Yeah. That is all three volumes of Lord of the Rings in this one book. Wow. I know. How and it was given that? incredibly thin, almost like tissue paper. And it was given to me as a 21st birthday present. So this book is 50 years old next year. I've never seen that. No, it's, mm. it's excellent. And it's got all the maps in it too. Mm. <laughs> so what did one... you make of it when you read it? As, as someone well, who loves fantasy. Oh, well, weirdly, weirdly, um, it, I was 13 or 14 before I came across it. And, and I came across it only because a friend of mine at school knew my love of fantasy. And she said, oh, you must love Lord of the Rings. I said, what's that? She said, you've not read Lord of the Rings? Things. What are you about? So I went and, and got, I think, a library book and, and sort of literally read it voraciously. And by the time it was this beautiful copy was given to me when I was 21, I think I'd read it about five times. I spent one weekend when I was about 16. And I remember I started on the Friday night and I didn't leave it until I finished it, all three volumes. Mm. <laughs> it's amazing so I've always loved it and I've loved the Peter Jackson films yes. um, you know I've really adored them and there's so much in it that speaks to me and I'm sure to you by the sound of it as well absolutely I think it's like um, you know it's the John Kennedy effect you know you remember where yeah. you were when you read that book I was 23 and I had my first child and he had a lot of problems and he never slept and he cried all the time. So I used to have to walk around with him. So I had him in one, one arm and that book in the other. Oh, wow. Oh, my and that's, goodness. That's how I got through it because otherwise I, was, I would have just gone crazy. You yeah. know, I could walk around reading the book and holding him at the same time. But, oh, my God, it, it just, you know, all the hippies were reading it and my sister told me about it and I thought, oh, you know, I've got to read it because everyone else is. But, oh, it was just, I, I couldn't describe it. You know, yeah. it was like nothing else I'd ever read. Absolutely. Me too. And, you know, when you know Tolkien's story a little bit, yeah. and of course I, I went to Oxford and, and he used to meet uh, folks in the, in the Eagle and Child, the pub, um, or the Bird and Babe, as it's sometimes called there. And um, amazing, just amazing stories. And between, I think, when, when in, um, uh, I think it's partway through, no, it's still in, in the first book, where Gandalf falls to the, with a Balrog. Yeah, mm. there was a whole gap. There was a huge gap before he went on. He didn't know how to go on at one point. So he just put it aside for years. Yeah. And then came back to it. And thank goodness he did, because what an inspiration. And I, who's your favourite character? <laughs> Is that who's your favourite child? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, yes. There are so many characters that I loved in it. I mean, so many. I loved the trees. Oh, the ants and the trees. Absolutely. So did oh, I. I. So do I. Yeah, yeah me yeah. too. But I yeah. love Sam Ganji. I love this. Yes. Yeah. This incredibly ordinary hobbit yeah. who's this extraordinary hero. 
and it and I love cool. that. Um, and legless, of course, and mm. of course, Gandalf. <laughs> yeah, 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 all of them. Yes, and of course, we've got the uh, the new series on TV at the moment, the uh, prequel. The prequel, yeah, indeed, yeah, we have yeah. with Galadriel as a young warrior. Yeah. Yes, Extraordinary. yeah, yeah. I'm I'm watching that with great interest to see how it unfolds. Me too, because the actual source material was so scant. You know, yes, I mean, I know the Tolkien estate gave obviously their agreement to it, but it's based on such a tiny amount of yeah. writing. So they've had to bring, you know, probably ninety five percent of it is is what the writers have done with it, um, rather than what Tolkien originally um, wrote. Yeah, you know, I've always thought if you could get in, into the mind, if you could climb into the mind of someone, who yeah. might it be? And I think Tolkien, for me, you know, I would love to spend a few hours in there. Absolutely. So would I. And I love his, you know, his his um, evocation of Middle Earth and, and the beauty of it. And, and really England, you know, was, was where he was walking. And, yeah, and sort yeah. of seeing the beauty of, of our land. The, yeah, the, the other thing, of course, is he didn't just write the book. He created an entire cosmology. Yes, absolutely. And a language. And, and a language. Everything. everything. Yeah. 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 Incredible. Yeah. Amazing. So, okay, we have to move on. Book number three. I think book number three is going to be Conversations with God. Neil Donald Walsh. Neil Donald Walsh, yes. absolutely. And the reason was that was a time in my life when I thought I'd come to a place where I was going to stay my forever home, my forever work, my <laughs> whatever, my forever then husband. And it was like everything um, got thrown up in the air and over a very short period of time. And I had a, an astrologer friend come at the beginning of that year which was 1999 and she read my chart for the year the transits and her face drained of color <laughs> and she she sort of didn't say anything for a while and then she said um she said, Jude, I think by the end of the year you may have lost quite a few things that you thought you needed but you didn't but you will still have what you really truly need and she wouldn't say anything more than that it's a lovely way to put it. Isn't it? My house went, my work went, my husband of the time went. Um, and I ended up at the end of that year in a tiny little cottage um, with well water and a generator and my beloved cat Clovis for the turn of the millennium. And where from here? Where from here? And everything came from there. And that was when, at the time where everything was breaking down, again, Neil's book fell off the shelf. And I, I went straight through the conversations. I think by then he'd written at least three. And I just went through them. And they were nurturing. They nurtured, they nurtured my soul through that period. They, they helped me not to fall apart. They helped me to understand there was yeah. a deep, deep purpose for what was happening. And however I might not be able to see it, however challenge it was, they really, against with every other being that always helps me, they really brought me into that place of deep trust. Mm. Did they um, come as a surprise to you? No. No, not at all. No, but, but the way that Neil writes and really where he's writing from, from his own story, you know, just gave them that sense of authenticity that, that spoke at that deep level to me, going through my own, you know, breakdown and possible breakthrough uh, mm -hmm. at that period of time. And yeah. so it was almost like a life raft in a very, very stormy ocean through that period of time. I think many people have had a very similar reaction. Yeah. So the next book, number four. This then gets a little more, when was it exactly, and So I'll probably go back to the book Earth Prayers. And the reason I'll do that is that actually I've gone slightly out of um, chronology, but only slightly, because when I was living, um, before everything fell apart, I was living in this beautiful big house, near Avebury, the, the stone circle of Avebury in Wiltshire, which I still 
very much live in and love that landscape. But we used to hold ceremonial at Avebury at the Celtic eightfold year. So it would be the solstices, the equinoxes, yeah. and then the four quarter points. Yeah, so, so basically um, uh, the start of February, the start of May, the start of August, the start of November. And I came across, an, and I think I came across in a bookstore uh, called The Henge in Avebury. And it's a book of 365 prayers, earth prayers, that are really from all over the world and many, many different traditions. And I would, and, and the folks I was working with, we just attune with, you know, what earth prayer we would invite and welcome and share in all the events and workshops and rituals and ceremonials that we did, you know, over, I think, I mean, it's very, very worn because I've used it so much, but I've been using it now for well over 20 years. So you can see it's been, it's been used. <laughs> And I still do. I still value and welcome and love its poetry, its invocations that all honour Gaia. Mm. So that's my next book. So that book is Earth Prayers from Around the World, edited by Elizabeth Roberts. Yes. Elias, and Elias Amidon. Yes. yes. And it's got prayers by people like uh, Voices, Walt Whitman, Thich Nhat Hanh, Black Elk, yes. Margaret yes. Atwood. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and many traditions, you know, some are anonymous and they come from, you know, Jewish, indigenous, Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, secular, all traditions. Um, and they're very, very beautiful and really speak to the heart. Mm -hmm. So book number five. Book number five. I think I would go with The Living Universe, actually, by a dear friend of mine, Dwayne Elgin, who has been a a campaigner and earth yes. guide and guard for many, many, many decades. Yes, yes, yes. What a what an interesting man he is. Yeah. I've had the privilege of interviewing Dwayne. Yeah. So tell us about the book, how it came into your life and the impact it had on you. Well, Dwayne and I have known each other quite some time. And the book asks, where are we? Who are we? Where are we going? And 20 years ago thereabouts, I was given guidance that I would eventually, and this was before I wrote any books, um, that I would eventually write a trilogy that I was guided to, to call the, <laughs> nothing trivial, the Transformation Trilogy. <laughs> and in 2017, I wrote The Cosmic Hologram that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And in 2022, now the story of Gaia is just about to be published. Um, and there's a third book, um, that is entitled, provisionally entitled, Many Voices, One Heart. Now, the titles for these books and the idea of the trilogy, as I say, was guided to me uh, back 20 years ago. And I was told that the first book would help us understand who we are, where we are. The second book would be, again, who we are, where we are, and perhaps offer us where we might go. And the third book would be very much where we go. So I discovered Dwayne's work and we've worked together and been together on a number of occasions. Um, some years ago, before I wrote much at all, and certainly before I started to write the Transformation Trilogy, but it spoke to me. And again, all the books that I love speak to me on the level of mind, heart and yes, purpose yes. Yes. and soul. Yeah. And, and Dwayne's definitely does that. Mm. Yeah, it is, a, it is a very good book. So we're going to take a short break now. We'll be back in a few minutes, so stay tuned. Om Times TV Maya Angelou once said that there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. And when I'm not hosting Om Times Media's flagship radio show, What Is Going On, and the No BS Spiritual Book Club, I help people share their untold stories. Books are my life, my joy, and my passion. And there is no greater reward than helping aspiring writers get their books out of their heads and into the hands of those who are waiting to read them. If you feel that you have a book in you, but don't know where to begin, visit sedgebeer.com, click on the Work With Me tab, 
and find out how my experience helping others tell their stories might be just what you've been looking for. That's sedgebeer.com, S-E-D-G-B-E-E-R.com. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust, spheric approach. Own Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back. Jude Carivan, this is interesting because I'm trying to second guess you. I'm looking at your list as I've got it and I'm trying to work out, okay, which one is going to come next? So tell me about book number six. Okay, we'll see if you're right, (laughs) Sandy. Before we do, I just want to say one more thing about Dwayne's book that really Mm. spoke to me. And that was the title itself, The Living Universe. Because all the work that I've done over so many years Um, And certainly in the Cosmic Hologram, again, and the story of Gaia speaks to an essentially living and evolutionary universe, you know, where mind and consciousness aren't something we have. They're literally what we in the whole world are and a universe that exists to evolve meaningfully and purposefully. So I think that's the other point about Dwayne's book. It really resonated with me from that perspective uh, of a relationship with a living universe so yeah a symbiotic relationship yeah yeah absolutely so where next okay the coming into spiritual age okay okay i would have gone for i'll tell you when it comes up (laughs) (laughs) we're coming into spiritual age published in 2013 by kurt johnson and david robert ord Absolutely. Supposed to be the first book to review and predict the ongoing history of world religions and spirituality in the context of developmental history and the evolutionary consciousness movement. <sighs> yes. It, 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 I mean, it's a book written. Kurt was a monk for a number of years, and he used to work with pioneers of interfaith uh, you know, into faiths such as Wayne Teasdale and, and others. And he is an extraordinary man and a very dear friend of mine. And what I found particularly helpful is that what he was showing is there are, there's a confluence, there's, a, there's an ongoing direction of travel possible of taking the, you know, the, 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 the commonality of, of underlying truths that lie at the, you know, the fundament of each and all of the religions, which yes. are ultimately spiritual rather than organizational, and then really bringing those together so that this, these sort of themes of interspirituality can be understood as a direction of travel for us. You know, it's, it's all faiths and none. And what I particularly love is about, is that, you know, what he talks about is really what's happening and what I write about in the convergence of science and spirituality, which takes it to the whole next level where there is that confluence in terms of a, 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 you know, truly whole world view of the nature of reality. And another dear, dear friend, Elizabeth Sartorius, has this great metaphor of consciousness and all is consciousness as a piano keyboard 
of just different notes and different vibrations. And, you know, the spirituality folks stand on the high notes and look down on the, <laughs> the bottom. <laughs> and the ones at the bottom look up and go, you're out of here. And she says, you know, it's the whole keyboard. And yeah. the more we can work together across the keyboard, within ourselves and together with that unity and diversity, that's really what ultimately collective human evolutionary consciousness is all about. So I just love Kurt's work and, and it, it really brought it very clearly of the potential of, of perceiving, you know, into spirituality, but still grounded in traditions and, and, and you know, faith-based cultures. You know, it's not asking anybody who is basically a, a Hindu and our new prime minister is a practicing Hindu, Rishi Sunak, he actually did his oath of office as an MP on the Bhagavad Gita. Really? So, yes. So it's not saying, you know, that's your tradition. No, it's saying that's your tradition. Now expand. And, you know, from that yeah. tradition, ap appreciate what connects us, what joins us, what we have in common. You know, I've often wondered uh, why I chose to be born now. And I'm just beginning to get an answer to that in all the uh -huh. books that I'm coming across that, um, you know, where science and spirituality are meeting. Yeah. And that's yeah. one of my big passions that, you know, that's what I like talking about, because we have so much evidence now, yeah. you know, it, and it grounds the whole thing. And you can't call people who are interested in uh, spirituality, you know, um, marshmallow new ages anymore because there, there's solid proof there is and that's what i write about in in the cosmic hologram and the story of gaia but you know it's it's i'm really interested just how quickly i think this is going to switch into mainstream yes. because two nobel laureates this year in physics alan aspect yes. and selinger are all about, you know, yeah. universal non-locality. Yeah. Uh, Professor Brian Cox, who I'm sure quite a lot of our read, uh, readers, listeners will know, and Jeff Forshaw, have just had an article in New Scientist saying space and time emerge from deeper levels yes. of something. They, then, they don't know what it is, but they know that yeah. the appearance of our universe is not its fundamental reality. And they're just, they're just about to bring out a book on the subject so you know it's, it's very interesting how it's it's suddenly getting there very exciting very yeah. okay so number seven number seven i think i will go with benedictus by john o'donoghue okay and the reason for that chronologically is that a few years ago i was invited to be um a, an advisor the senior advisor for someone doing a phd on john o'donoghue and I'd come across him and I loved his work but actually being a senior advisor to somebody doing a PhD it helps if you know quite a bit about the subject you're advising on <laughs> so I went deep 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 into John O'Donoghue's work and it's incredible and inspiring and he had a book that I already knew called Anam Kara which some mm. folks will know which is very beautiful but he also wrote a book called Benedictus. And I got that book and it's, it's Benedictus means blessings and it's a book of blessings. And so it's a blessing for strangers. It's a blessing at the end of the day. It's a blessing for grief. It's a blessing for joy. It's a blessing for different times of the year, for beginnings, for endings. It's, it's as broad as, you know, so much of our lives. He brings forward these beautiful words a poetic blessing that really, again, for me, and I know for many, many other people, really resonate at a deep heart level. Mm, yeah. Book of Gratitudes. Yeah. Gratitudes and Blessings. Yeah. Beautiful. And it's okay. one that I dip into because if there's something in yeah. my life, I, I'll go and I'll open the book and, and I'll see there's a blessing for it. And, you know, if it's a challenge, it will ease me if it's if it's a woohoo it will heighten me even further it's such a beautiful beautiful gift of of his um genius and spirit he, he comes up quite often you know yeah. various of his books come up quite often he seems to be a very well-loved man i have to confess i haven't read um but i need to 
and will. I'm sure you'd love, uh, certainly Anam Cara, but also yeah. Benedictus, yeah, and his other writings, but I think those are so beautifully accessible and, and, and speak to us that, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so where are we? I'm losing track of our numbers. Is, what's the next one? I think we've got... Wisdom of the left. We've got three left, yes. Three left. Yes. yes. Um, I the, the, the Wisdom of the Rishis and the other book, Not To His Peace, which are two of the three, came to about the same time. And the Wisdom of the Rishis is, is a beautiful book of ancient Vedic sages, the, the ancient sages of ancient India who are called Rishis. And it's conversations with their students. And this particular book is written by um, a very wise man called Sri M. And I had the great joy of, of both meeting and working with him when he came to London a while ago. We did a walk uh, together um, with a number of folks around London and churches and, and, and mosques and, and, and synagogues. Um, a walk of unity and hope a few years ago about, I think it was 2018 or very, yeah, it would have been 2018 or very early in 2019. And he's such a wonderful man. And we spoke together after the walk at the, at the uh, Nehru Centre in central London. And I found out about his book. And again, he's, a, he's passionate about the convergence of science and spirituality. And of course, the ancient Indian traditions was exactly that, that consciousness is the nature of reality. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I was reading about him earlier. Um, he was born a Muslim, attracted to Vedic teachings at an early age and met his guru at the age of nine. Yeah. That's yeah. incredibly young. Yeah. It, it is. And he's been on that journey ever since. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's a former trustee of the Krishnamurti Foundation. Yep. And he says, rather than choosing any specific religion or tradition, he teaches the universal essence of all religions. And he does. And this is exactly it. So he and I got very excited together. <laughs> 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 we, we so enjoyed. We so enjoyed. We had this wonderful exploration and dialogue. And, and I spoke some in Sanskrit. Um, which of course I'm fluent in, not, but I spoke, <laughs> <laughs> but I spoke some of the words from the Shnavaya Upanishad, which is the one that, for me, is the most fundamental of all of the uh, of all of the teachings. And again, it's it's the consciousness is the nature of reality. Mm, yeah. So not to is peace. That's a weird title. Not to number two is peace. Yeah. The ordinary people's way of global. Cooperative order by Adi Dar. Adi Dar, yeah, uh, that had an, an introduction by Irving Laszlo. Tell me about that book. What does that title mean? Well, Adi Dar again teaches unity and unity and diversity, but his languaging is is prior unity. So that is a sense of prior unity that's then differentiated into two or three or more. So when he says not to is peace, what he means is when you when you realize that you are inseparable, that there is differentiation, but not separation, then that is the way of peace. OK, so that's what he's meaning by the title. Yeah. yeah. And um, I'm good friends with with two of his uh, closest uh, devotees and, and colleagues when he was, uh, you know, uh, on Earth. Um, but what was lovely is in uh, November of 2018, we organised a gathering at, in London. Um, we break out groups at Westminster Abbey and House of Lords, as you do. Um, but the date that we chose without knowing it was the 10th anniversary of his passing. So all of the Adidas community sent us a blessing for our unity conference in London that day. It was so beautifully synchronous. Um, and so I'm very fond of, 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 of his teachings. And, he, and what it's about is about how do you bring this unity and diversity into a lived experience, everyday life, mm -hmm. everyday life. 
Um, and that's what he means is the ordinary people's way to uh, of global cooperation. Um, and, and I love that. Um, yeah. 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 So your last book, what a beautiful book to choose. <laughs> Joy, Lasting Happiness in a Changing World, Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Yeah. yeah. What a book. What, what a book. What, what, what two wonderful souls. Two incredibly inspiring souls. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, both of them had their trials and tribulations and, you know, to come through all of that laughing and full of joy. And I think that is exactly the examplars. You know, I talk about, in you know, going beyond being a role model to being a soul model. So, yeah. And for me, those two are soul models. And, you know, I, you, never, you never saw Desmond Tutu, you never see the Dalai Lama without, they're just laughing the whole time. Yeah, <laughs> they, 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 they get the joke. joke. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and laughing at each other's jokes and laughing at their own jokes. I mean, I can't tell a joke. Because if I, if I find it funny, I start laughing part way through so I can never get, I can never get to the punchline. And I love that of them and that, as you say. Yeah. And, and my mum was the same, you know. My mum's life was really hard by, by many people's criteria. But she had the most amazing sense of humour. And if it, I, I don't know. I think it's in the genes because I laugh a lot. I can't be serious for very long at all. And I'm just so grateful for, you know, taking the world seriously to a degree, never taking myself very seriously, but also trying to really being able to find the joy in as much as I possibly can. Well, that's that's the key, isn't it? You know, some of the people that I've met in my life who have been the most joyful, the ones who had the most to complain about but never did. Yes. You know? and, and that's amazing to me, to, to watch people who are in so much pain and can't yeah. walk and they're confined to it, you know, and they just take joy in the smallest things. Absolutely. And vice versa, you know, you get folks who, you know, really live a very privileged life yeah. who, you know, just moan. It's like, yes. no, get over yourself, please. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever meet the Dalai Lama or... Desmond no, Tutu. but Kurt has, who I was mentioning earlier. Kurt has, and and another friend of mine, Olivia has Hansen, um, and and again, what you see is what you get. You know, he's yeah. not in any way different. If you meet him very privately or if he's on a big stage, he just is authentically who he is, and that for me just is an example of soul modelling. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's your 10 best list, and what a great list it is. Um, let's talk a little bit about you now. Um, you were one of the most senior businesswomen in the UK. What kind of business were you in, and why did you switch to what you're doing now? I don't think I switched. I think I came home to what I'm doing now rather than switching. <laughs> but, yes, I was. I, I After I did my master's degree at Oxford, um, very circumstances meant that I was not going to go into an academic um, role. And so I went into corporate life and I trained as an accountant because I'm good at numbers. Um, and so I, I just loved it. And, and I, I spent 25 years um, from the age of 21 to my mid-40s um, working in, in roles that were global, essentially. My last two roles, um, I was the uh, the world finance director, you know, the worldwide finance director for two $500 million businesses. Uh, one was in music retailing and the other was in, in uh, well-being and healthcare. And um, when I was appointed to the, the latter, um, that was when I became, for all of 10 minutes, <laughs> the most senior businesswoman in, in Britain. Um, and I was on the in the papers and all the rest of it with this terribly staged photo. <laughs> But I loved it. And then um, by the mid 90s, I think I got to do one business plan too many. I'd come to the end of the road and I, I just got to a point where I was no longer enjoying it. Um, and therefore, it wasn't right for me to continue. 
Um, and also, I was also being guided because, of course, all my walking between worlds and all the rest of it was happening alongside all of this. I was being guided that something big was coming some sort of shift, some sort of breakdown and breakthrough, some sort of potential for conscious evolution. You know, it was very, it wasn't that clear, but it was very powerful. And I was, I just felt now's the time to leave corporate life. And I don't know what I'm going to do. I felt really like that um, card in the tarot of the fool holding a rose and, and just stepping off a cliff. Um, but I was very fortunate. I was very well looked after. And I had a beautiful soft landing. But yeah, um, I, I, I was guided that I needed to serve in the way that I've been seeking to serve um, ever since. And did you find that when you said yes in your heart to this shift, this return home, um, that everything just fell into your lap? The path just opened up in front of you? Or was it hard? hard because <laughs> I knew that it was the right thing to do but I was still sort of half in half out of my old life as it were and you know I'd had a diary booked a year ahead I'd had a personal assistant I was being you know treated to first class travel and da 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 and all the rest of it and it wasn't that I missed any of that but I, I wasn't but in a way it was the mask of who I thought I was to some degree if that makes sense and what I was happening was I was being stripped away of that mask. And and then, you know, if I chose to, if I allowed myself to, to become more authentically who I was and am and realise it's an ongoing journey. So there was that sort of transition period, which was quite hard um, and yet very necessary. And it probably took about three years. Mm. And then once I had moved through that and been willing to be guided through that and opened up and said really said yes then yes everything just yeah. flowed and it's still you know it's still that you know I, I there's still ups and downs of course there is but it's rather like I guess you know being in an ocean with a lot of change going on a lot of turbulence but you've got a life vest on and you've got a nice rubber ring around you and you're bobbing up and down and you know you're not going to sink. Um, and I think that's really, really important for all of us at this time to have that knowingness and that trust that we are so incredibly well looked after. But it is about allowing and surrendering. You know, somebody said, let go and let God. Yeah, yeah. And when we're still holding on, you know, as I was for a period of time, it was only when I let go and honestly truly let god and i think going back to neil i think that was part of what came out of that mm. was was that understanding and that message and then everything has flowed is flowing mm. you mentioned earlier about you knew you were told that you were going to write the trilogy uh, the transformation trilogy um when it came you know how did that actually come into being you know, because it starts off just, well, there's a title and I'm going to write something about this, but I don't know when and I don't know where to start. How did it actually unfold for you? Well, first of all, I never meant to be a writer. Um, I did my PhD in the early 2000s and that and a PhD, it's, it's on the thing behind me. I don't you can see it. It's this thing here and it's that thick and it's got 59 pages of bibliography. It's very academic, of course. Uh, and, and it nearly killed me. And I thought, I, no, 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 I'm not going to write anymore. And then at the same time, um, I'd been guided to do a number of journeys around Gaia and activate certain sites. And that was both an inner and outer journey. And although I kept no notes or anything of else, and I never intended to write about those journeys, um, after they completed, there was a guidance that says, write this down. And when I was writing it down, uh, a publisher approached me, not having seen anything that I'd written, and just said, oh, we think you might be able to write. So literally, the universe came forward and said, okay, do this. And then there were a number of other other books. Um, and whilst that was happening, you know, the, the, the guidance came. But the books write me. 
it, it sounds very strange, yeah. but the books write me and they write me when the time is right to write me. Yeah. Um, and that was the case for the Cosmic Hologram in 2017 and now the story of Gaia in 2022. Tell us a little bit about the story of Gaia. The story of Gaia really continues on from the Cosmic Hologram. The Cosmic Hologram sets out, you know, the underpinning and the framing of a cosmology of consciousness, of unity and unified reality. And therefore it's that sort of, it's quite sciencey because it's sort of grounding that emergent radical new understanding with all the evidence that's available now. The story of Gaia is, is, is sort of is more experiential. People who've read it, the, you know, the early endorsers, it sort of reads them, just as it wrote me, it sort of reads them. And I think it read, it's read you. And, and it's in a sense that it's Gaia speaking to you Yes. And every reader through the book and, and almost inviting you and every reader into a deeper relationship where you might start as being Sandy, a human being, and you complete by being Sandy, a Gaian. Yes. <laughs> and, yes. and it's the story of a, of a meaningful and purposeful universe that exists to evolve to ever greater levels of complexity and self-awareness. Uh, individuation, interdependence, into being, but it's not really the story of humans in that sense. It is the story of Gaia, but we are seen, we are welcomed into that story as Gaians. I love the idea of considering ourselves as you know. I'm not British, not American, not anything else. One race, one yeah. being, Gaians. Yeah. Yeah. And realising and, and having a relationship with her as a living planet, as a conscious planet in a living and conscious universe. And where, you know, the universe didn't start 13.8 billion years ago in the implied you know, chaos of a Big Bang, but began as the, the incredibly fine-tuned and ordered and first moment of an ongoing big breath, which again comes back to the wisdom of the rishis, you know, this, this Indian understanding of the breath of Brahman. So as space expands and time flows, we are in this incredible story of Gaia, story of our universe. Mm. Um, and with everything as having meaning and purpose, which means we are innately meaningful and purposeful. And we are microcosmic co-creators. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There's one thing that puzzles me in the book, and, and that is... The universe is not infinite, it's finite. Yes. So tell me more about that. Ooh. Well, um, I don't get physics-y on you or science-y on you too much, but essentially there are a number of pieces of evidence that shows us that it's our, our universe is a finite unified entity, rather like a, a finite thought form in the infinite and eternal mind of the cosmos. So, you know, our, our infinite eternal cosmos may, may have many, many, many universal thoughts, but our universe, we know it began a finite time ago, as I say, the first moment of a big breath. Everything that is manifested within it, within space-time, is of itself finite. We also know from the, the relic radiation from a very early stage of, of our universe called the cosmic microwave background. It's literally radiation that fills the whole of space. So as space is expanded, it's too just continue to fill it. The, the wavelengths of the radiation are of themselves have a finite cutoff, which says that it has to be finite. We also know that there's a, a process whereby as space expands, it cools down. And that has a relationship with the amount of information that can be held within our universe as it evolves. And we can measure that. And we know that we're now, the universe began in an incredibly hot temperature, very ordered, but incredibly hot, you know, trillions and trillions of times hotter, uh, well, trillions at least times hotter than the, the center of our sun. But as space expands, it cools down. So we're now only a few degrees 
above absolute zero. So that says there's not much longer to go as more information comes, but as, as space continues to expand, it'll, it'll, it'll cool down to very close to absolute zero. So there's a process there. The other thing we know is that most of the hydrogen in our universe, which is the basic fuel of stars, is already used up. So the amount of star making now is a tiny proportion of what it was in the past. So there's many, many different pieces of evidence that are pointing to our universe, rather like a bubble, you know, expanding and then whoosh, coming to the end of its life with all of that understanding, consciousness, experience, wisdom, just being you know, allowed back into the cosmic plenum. Wow. And, and onward. Yeah, I, I, I love it because it, everything, everything comes together with the evidence and the framing and the underpinning. And it's so beautiful because other mm. universes may come from the wisdom of ours. You know, we might have come from an earlier universe. Yes, yes, yes. Of yes. course, that because everything is so fine-tuned yeah. incredibly so so you know there may be a, a, a we can't you can't measure infinity but there probably mm. very likely what other universes before ours yeah. Yeah. certainly yeah. ours is in, incredibly intelligent from the get-go mm. its sentience its consciousness was there from the get-go rather like a baby it had all you know it had everything ready than to live its life. Mm. Mm. Wow. So the third book, tell me about <laughs> the third book, Many Voices, One Heart. You say you haven't even started that one yet. No, it, it's not ready to write me yet, but it will be the story of us. And it will be the story going back to, to what we were saying earlier with, with Dwayne. Where are we? Who are we? Where are we going? And the emphasis will be on where are we now? Where we come from for sure. But where are we now and where are we going? And perhaps the title says it, Many Voices, One Heart. Mm -hmm. That is but what I I'm think about. when you say you're waiting for it to write you, do you not also think that uh, it is waiting for us to yes. write it? Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's not ready. We're not ready. The story is not, and the story is never complete. You know, there's always another chapter and another step of the journey. But we're in such a turbulent time at the moment. My sense is that we're in a time of, of turbulence and transition. And so it, it is waiting for us. Our universe is waiting for us. This is our moment of choice. Yes, yes, yes. How do you think we're going to choose? Well, if I didn't hope that we would choose love, I wouldn't be here having this conversation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, ultimately, that's all there is. Of course. <laughs> yeah. You know, what I write about is the science of love. It's yeah. that science that we... And right at the beginning of the story of Gaia, as you know, I say the book's dedicated for everyone who's waking up to remember we're inseparable. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I hope... The rest of the world wakes up very quickly. Jude, um, what can we do to speed up this awakening? What can we do, to, you know, our part of this process? Take the evidence seriously. Take the evidence that our universe exists and evolves as a meaningful, purposeful, unified entity, a great thought in the mind of the cosmos, that it has inherent meaning and purpose as we do, that we truly are its microcosmic co-creators, that, that unity is our existential reality. It's not an aspiration. And that it's real. It is the nature of reality. And then on that basis, what then? And I, I just invite everybody to say, on that basis, what is the most fundamental way that we can live our lives? And for me... It's to be soul models of what's called the golden rule. Yeah. yeah. 
and including our planetary home with that. As my dear friend Kim Polman, who co-founded something called Reboot the Future, whose whole raison d'etre is living the golden rule, treat others as you, treat others and our planetary home, Gaia, as you would wish to be treated. Yeah, absolutely. So you have a course on Ubiquity Universe, on decoding life revealing a radical new view of reality tell me a little bit about that it sounds a bit fascinating i'll be happy to i mean that's quite uh, that was based on the cosmic hologram so that's the whole of the evidence and the learning and the insights and everything else from the cosmic hologram but also very experiential so it's got lots of practice and and invitations to experience in it and very more recently literally a few weeks ago I also uh, was invited to uh, record a 16-module uh, class for humanities team online called Our Conscious Revolution, Empowering Our Transformational Journey to Wholeness and, 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 and Belonging. So the first is on ubiquity, the second is on humanities team, and the second one about our conscious revolution is very much now up to date with the, the story of Gaia too, and again is, is full of, of practices and invites and attunements and just telling this wonderful story of who we are and where we come from and where we can be going. Mm. So... Um... Many Voices, One Heart, you say that it, it will be published in 24, 25. You haven't start, started with writing it yet. It hasn't started writing you yet. What are you <laughs> going to do between now and when it does start writing you? Well, um, we were already, you know, I co-founded Whole World View back in 2017 um, on really to bring this message um, of understanding, experiencing and embodying unitive awareness into the world so we are linking up and lifting up with many active partners i work extensively as a member of the evolutionary leader circle and we're moving into partnership networks um, you know over this next period of time so i get involved in all sorts of stuff around conscious business and bringing a sort of a unitive narrative which is also based on this science of wholeness into conscious business into governance um, into the United Nations. We're just hopefully going to have the agreement to have a, what's called a thematic cluster at the United Nations based on unitive awareness for the first time ever in its 77 years, which enables uh, all sorts of initiatives to be underpinned and framed by this unitive awareness and unitive narrative. So I get a, involved in a lot of of to serve change, to serve transformational change in the world. A lot of it's under the radar, but it's happening. And, and you know, linking up and lifting up with many, many folks who are as, as you know, you know realising that not only is this our moment of choice, but what such a choice based on love and unity and diversity and ultimately unity and belonging can mean for us, for our conscious evolution. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> okay. You um, you did write a, a novel, didn't you, called did. Legacy? Legacy, yeah. Legacy. When did you write that and what is that about? I wrote that ages ago. And I keep being told, you know, it should be made into a film. But I self-published it. It's almost like a slightly fictionalised version of what's happening. And it's also based on some esoteric teachings and, and some metaphysics. And it's an adventure story, but it's ultimately a story of redemption. It's a story from separation to mm. remembered wholeness. And Legacy of Itself is just the first book, again, of a trilogy. So I'm partway through the second book at the moment. Mm. <laughs> so what, what do you regard as your legacy? Is it the you trilogy know, of transformation? I, I I don't go into that space particularly. I, you know, I'm I'm here to serve as best I can. I hope I'm here to show up and get out of the way, and I don't feel that it's for me to say what my legacy is. Mm. And if it's and if it's an anonymity, that's fine. It's the message and the how do we serve? You know, yeah. our, our 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 collective human family, and for me, 
personally, even more importantly, our planetary home, Gaia and all her children. Well said, Jude Carrivan. Thank you so much for adding your 10 best list to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's library of recommendations. Thank you, Sandy. It's been wonderful. I've loved exploring these books and what lovely memories you've helped me bring back about them. I'm glad. I'm glad you got so much out of it because we certainly have. Thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Jude Carrivan's books include Cosmos, a co-creator's guide to the whole world, co-authored with Dr. Irvin Laszlo, the award-winning The Cosmic Hologram in Formation at the Centre of Creation, and the latest book, The Story of Gaia, The Big Breath and the Evolutionary Journey of Our Conscious Planet. They're published by Inner Traditions. For more information about her work, her books, uh, everything that she's doing, uh, go to judecarivan.com and also wholeworld-view.org. That's it for this week. I uh, will be back at the same time next week with another edition of uh, 10 Best Spiritual Books for the No BS Spiritual Book Club. Till then, it's goodbye from me. Thank you, Jude. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. <laughs>